Should we tip in restaurants and cafes? What percentage is acceptable? Who should we tip and who shouldn't we tip? We'll be discussing this question in this episode of Aprender Inglés with Rezan Craig. Hello and welcome. My name's Craig. And my name's Reza. With over 45 years of teaching between Reza and I, we're going to help you improve your English and take it to the next level. How are you this morning, Reza? Well, apart from a little bit of hay fever, allergy to pollen, I'm fine. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. No hay fever. I'm feeling good. How long does this usually last? When does the pollen stop? It uh, usually lasts an hour or two, but occasionally it does affect me all day. But I kind of know when that's going to happen. And today I know it's just going to be half an hour, an hour or so. Okay. <laughs> I hope. So forgive me, listeners, if I sneeze, if I go, Urgh! if I sneeze, please forgive me. So this episode, we're speaking about tipping. But first, we have an email from Fernanda from Uruguay. Reza, would you like to read it? Yes, sure. She says, hi, Reza and Craig. So nice to hear you guys. I'm Fernanda from Uruguay, and I'm so amazed by your podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Fernanda. I crossed out, she says, but I think she means I came across your episodes when I was searching some, mm, but to say when I was looking for, Fernanda, looking for some help with my English. I'm a CAE student, the Certificate of Advanced English. I find you very entertaining. And you are so clear when you explain everything. Sometimes it's hard for me to understand your Spanish, I must say. <laughs> Pro yes, Fernanda. Probably my Spanish that Fernanda finds it difficult to understand, I think. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm no expert myself. Uh, she goes on. I have a question for you two. The thing is that I want to be an English teacher in the future, but I have what I would call a problem. When I'm doing exercises or talking, I never think of the grammatical structure of a tense or what kind of word it is. You would laugh, but I really suck at discerning subjects like nouns, pronouns, adjectives, etc. Do you think this would be an important factor for not being able to teach? Thank you very much. Keep on posting. Hugs from Latin America, Fernanda Erlich. Well, thank you very much for the email. And that's a very interesting question. Before we talk about it, Fernanda, I really suck at discerning subjects like nouns, pronouns. What does suck mean? Yes, that's <laughs> clearly an American usage. We wouldn't say that in Britain or Ireland. But if something or somebody sucks, it means they're really bad at something or very unpleasant. It's definitely a negative thing. So if you suck at something, it means you're very bad at it. You're not competent at it. What would we say in British English? Maybe we're bad at it or we're... Uh, or I'm terrible at it. Or, yeah. Or we I stink at it. Stink at something. Or, or I can't do it to save my life. Maybe. Yeah. I have a feeling that Fernanda is exaggerating. I'm sure, I'm sure she doesn't really suck at it. What do you think? Well... Personally, as an English teacher, I sympathize with Fernanda because I don't like grammar. I don't like teaching grammar and I didn't like learning it when I became an English teacher. But you kind of do as you're teaching, don't you? With the experience, you become good at grammar because you need to explain it. You need to know what the grammar is. So with time, Fernanda, you will learn about grammar. But I've always preferred vocabulary, pronunciation, but grammar is an integral part of the language, which means it's an important part of the language. And as a teacher, yeah, you kind of have to know it. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. Unlike Craig, though, I must admit, I do quite like grammar and I like teaching it. But just the same as Craig, I didn't really know that much about it before I started teaching. So, Fernanda, don't worry. You learn on the job. 
Right. You know, and as you go along. I remember when I first started teaching, if a student asked me a really difficult grammar question and I didn't know the answer, I'd say, that's a very, very good question. We don't have time this lesson, but next lesson, I promise we will look at this grammar. And that gave me some time to study it and learn it and then teach it the following lesson. Yes, uh, you'll learn these little techniques as you go along, Fernanda. And another thing you'll also find with time, Fernanda, you'll become more comfortable with grammar because nobody knows everything about everything. There will be times when students ask a question and you just don't know the answer. So because I'm feeling more comfortable and more relaxed about the grammar, I say, well, I'm not sure. Let's look at some example sentences, write them on the board. And then by putting examples on the board, very often that clarifies what the problem is, what the grammar is. And together with your students, you can examine it and find out the answer. Do you do that? Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Yeah. But that's because you're feeling comfortable with it now. Maybe yeah. in your first year of teaching, you, you wouldn't really, I wouldn't have done that when, no. I was, when I was teaching in the beginning. No, I would now, but at the beginning, no. So, Fernanda, it, just be patient. I'm sure you will become an expert in grammar someday. Well, thanks very much for your email. Okay, let's move on to tipping. There was a blog post about tipping, and to be clear, to tip is dar propina. It's actually an abbreviation. T-I-P, tip, means to ensure promptness, to make sure the service is prompt or quick and efficient. So that's what tip means, propina. Though, of course, Craig, there are other meanings of tip. That's right. But we're not going to talk about them today. But you should know them, perhaps, to tip something, for example, to tip something over the edge. Imagine a book is on the edge of a table. It might fall off and I just touch it with my hand, and it falls off. I tipped it over the edge. So to tip something can make it fall over an edge, un borde. That's another meaning of tip. Also, the end of a pencil or a pen, the, the bit where, where the ink comes out of, or the bit where you, you touch the paper, is a tip as well. Or the tip of your finger, the, the end of your finger, so kind of the end bit, is also a very common word, tip. Good point. And you've also got phrasal verbs to tip out. If you empty the waste paper basket, for example, la basura, then you tip out the rubbish somewhere or you tip something out of a container. So you can tip out, tip on. So there are also phrasal verbs yeah. with tip. And of course, another important noun, a tip, not in the meaning of money that we're going to talk about now, but a useful piece of advice. I'll give you a tip. Try to... Remember phrasal verbs in groups. Okay. That's a good tip. It's a good tip. Put all the phrasal verbs to do with doing the housework together, to wash up, to hang out the clothes, etc. That's a tip, a useful piece of advice. Oh, and there's also a rubbish tip as a noun. So you have an old washing machine or an old hot water heater that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I, <in> fact, <laughs> Craig's laughing because... Today, I'm getting a new water heater delivered. Hopefully, if the delivery man comes, everybody knows what they're like. Let's see. Razor's been taking cold showers for over a week. <laughs> it's true. So are you going to take your old water heater to the tip? Well, luckily, the delivery man also takes it away and he tips it. He takes it to the tip. And will you give him a tip? Uh, I <laughs> might. I might because the poor man will have to walk up four flights of stairs and that's hard work. So I might give him a tip. That's the tip we're talking about, propina. I might give him a tip. Exactly. So Reza might give the man a tip to take the water heater to the rubbish tip. Anyway, there was a blog post on tipping in the UK and there's a link to it in the show notes on our website at englishpodcast.com slash 232. And it's a BBC blog post about tipping. So sh would you like to read it? Sure. Here's an extract from the blog post. Restaurants will be legally barred, barred means prohibited, from keeping tips from staff in the UK. The move follows a public outcry, that's a protest, clamor, protesta, in 2015, when it emerged that many high street chains 
the high streets where most shops are, high street chains routinely took up to 10% of tips paid by credit and debit card. So what was happening was people wanted to tip the waiters or the waitresses, the individual people who had served them, but they didn't know that if they paid using a credit card or debit card and they added a tip, that 10% of that money went to the owner of the chain, not to the waiter. But people didn't know that that 10% was going to the actual shop owner. And what they're saying is the reason for them keeping this small percentage is to cover the charge of processing the credit card payment. So if you pay by credit card, then the, sh- the restaurant or the shop or the store has to pay a small percentage to the credit card company. So they, they, their reasoning for this was to keep keep the money. Although I'm not sure I believe that myself. To be honest, I don't know the details, but it seems like a downright lie. Mm-hmm. A uh, downright means without any pretense, because if you were going to pay with a credit or debit card anyway, without a tip, doesn't that already include the processing charge? It should, shouldn't it? Yeah. So why put an extra 10% on because, oh, you're giving us a tip, so we have to charge you more, but they weren't going to charge me that 10% if I didn't give a tip? Doesn't make sense at all. But no. I'm not surprised to hear it, but I think think it's a mere invention of the shop owners myself. I think you're probably right. So when you go to a restaurant or a store and you pay by credit card and you want to leave a tip, do you pay by credit card and leave a cash tip or do you include the tip in the credit card payment? I always tip in cash, never on a card. I've never done it in my life and I never will. What about you? Me too. Exactly the same. I don't know why I never thought about it until I read this article, but I think the reason is to make sure the cash or the money, the tip goes to the person who's serving me. Yeah, me too. It's just that reason. I don't want it to go to the owner of the establishment because I don't know anything about the owner. They might be a lovely person or they might be horrible. I don't know. I haven't met them. They didn't wait, wait on me. That means they weren't my waiter. So why should I give them any money? Exactly. So reading this article made us think, who should we tip? Who do we tip? And how do we tip? And what are the differences between countries? Is it the same tipping in the UK as America or in Spain, for example? We'll speak about that later. But first, who should we tip, Reza? What kind of places or professions would you normally tip? Would you tip a hairdresser? I occasionally do. Not often, but from time to time, I can't really tell you my own rules for tipping a hairdresser. Sometimes I just feel like it and I do. Hmm. But to be honest, I usually don't. I have to be in a really good mood. (laughs) The way no more. What about you? Do you tip hairdressers? It's straight. Exactly the same. Sometimes, rarely, I do. And again, only when I feel like it. And I always go to the same hairdresser. So I don't know if that makes a difference but yeah sometimes but not always not as a rule what about taxi drivers usually not always but usually and more often than not which means usually i will just make up the difference in the change so say for example the taxi fare is 29 20 29 euros 20 if i go to the airport then i would give 30 for example. So just make it up to the nearest euro and that would be the tip. That, what about you? I would do something similar, particularly if it's if it's a reasonable sum of money, such as 29 euros. But if it's like a short journey and it's like seven euros 50 or something like that, I'll only give it if I think the taxi driver has been nice, deserves it. If not, I will wait for the change, I must admit I definitely don't tip if the taxi driver drives too fast and if the taxi driver has really loud, annoying music and isn't considerate of me as a passenger, then I wouldn't tip. Yeah. What if they chat to you a bit in a friendly way? It depends how much. Ah. If they chat in a friendly way and have a nice conversation, then maybe I'll leave a tip. If I think they're talking just to get a tip, if that's the reason they're talking to me and you can kind of sense, you can feel that sometimes that they'll keep the conversation going just because they want the tip, then no. <laughs> I I, I but they're not the only ones. Have you noticed that sometimes some waiters are not particularly chatty? 
That's C H A T Y. They they chat or they like to chat. Don't give particularly good service. Mm-hmm. But suddenly at the end, when you're about to pay and might tip, oh, they're very friendly. Then smiles everywhere. In the last minute, have you noticed that? Yep. I that doesn't convince me either. I want them to be friendly from the start, or don't bother at the end. What about hotel receptionists or porters in a hotel? People who take your luggage to the room or the receptionist. I would never tip a hotel receptionist. I must admit, poor guys. I feel sorry for them. Porters, it depends. In a posh hotel, posh is pijo. I would just because I don't want to look bad. I must admit. <laughs> so it's a guilt thing. You feel guilty if you don't. That's interesting. I, not so much guilty. No, I don't really feel guilty. It's but it's just about uh, a worry about being the only person who doesn't tip. I would just I would feel embarrassed rather than guilty. It's like everybody's tipping, but not me. In a posh hotel, it's like, oh no, look at the look at the poor, the poor, miserable guy. You know what I mean? So I think oh, I better tip. Yeah. Would you say a lot of people feel that? I definitely do. I stayed in this year in a hotel in Madrid just for one night with my wife. And the receptionist was very nice and friendly. And you know it's normal to leave your bag if you check out and you're not leaving until the afternoon or the evening. So we were coming back to Valencia really late and I asked the woman if I could leave my bag in reception in the hotel. And that's normal. And she was very kind and she did. And I gave her a tip. I think I gave her two euros. And my wife said, why did you tip her? It's a normal thing. It's just a normal thing. So it was very strange to her that I tipped the receptionist. She didn't think it was necessary. So that was interesting. Of course, she's Spanish. Ah, right. We'll get on to that later. We'll get on to that later. (laughs) What about bar staff? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, Not if I order and pay at the bar, because I don't think they've really done much to earn the tip. But if I get waited on, if they bring it to the table and they're nice, I might give them a tip. Yeah. In Belfast, if you went to a pub regularly, would you offer to buy the barman or or the bar staff a drink? Yeah, that's very common, isn't it? It is, isn't it? In Britain and Ireland, instead of tipping, you say, what about one for yourself or have a drink yourself to the bar? The bar man or woman? Teachers, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> they should be, shouldn't they? It should be by law. It should be obligatory. <laughs> it should be a 20% service charge for all of your English teachers. But no, probably not. Although it's common to get gifts mm. sometimes from students. I've yeah. received chocolates or a cake sometimes or something similar. i never forget the best gift I was ever given for teaching somebody. I taught someone a few minutes, like 10 or 15 minutes every day after class. And as a, as a gift to show appreciation, this guy's mum gave me an absolutely br- delicious homemade salchichon. From, wow. But from Salamanca, which is like, you know, where they know about salchichons. And this was like a home and was like, oh, that's the, the best tip I've ever had. A, a big cured sausage is the best tip I've ever had in my life. Delicious. It was really good. Delicious. What about postal service delivery people? Now, we have to make a distinction here, I think, which means we have to make a difference between the private companies who bring parcels from Amazon, for example, and the people who work for the post office. There's no way I would tip post office staff because I feel they're basically, in Spain anyway, civil servants, kind of. Like, I'm not going to tip them. They're they're luckier than most workers. They've got fairly good contracts. I'm not going to tip them. What do you think? No, I agree. Although I do tip people who bring me parcels that I order online. I do do that because I feel that if I order again, I'd like the person to make an effort to come back if I'm not at home or leave me the piece of paper in my post office box downstairs so that I know that there's a parcel waiting for me at the post office. So yes, if somebody's working for a private company, I probably would give a Euro tip. For me, it all depends on the weight and size. I live on a fourth floor without any lift. So if it's a heavy object, I tip because I think it's it's a real hassle to bring that up to my door. Yeah. Occasionally I've been called on the buzzer or the bzz, bzz, and they said, I got a parcel for you and they want me to come down. Well, there's no way, Jose, I'm going to tip them then. <laughs> Forget about it. You no, know, if you go down, obviously no, no tip. But if they come up, maybe. Should you tip even if the service isn't that good? 
as I said earlier, the, the shame of not tipping in a posh hotel would make me tip the porters, even if they weren't that good. That would be the possibly the only situation where I would do it, even if I wasn't that happy about it. But virtually everything else, my answer is no. I don't tip if I'm not happy with the service. What about you? The same, but for me, it very much depends on the tipping culture of the country I'm in. So let's speak about that for a little, because it really does depend where you are, I think, on if you tip or if you don't tip and how much. So looking at the UK first, there's a website called tripsavvy.com. Again, the link is in the show notes on the webpage. And they say the following, at restaurants, they recommend tipping 12.5 to 15% on the cost of the bill. Takeaway restaurants, small change. Taxi drivers, 10%. Hotel staff, one to two pounds. A pound is like 1.1 euros at the moment. So that's about one to two euros. And a tour guide, if you're on holiday in the UK, between 10 and 15%. Now, do you agree with those numbers? Do you think anything strange or any comments? No, I would say that's about the standard these days in the UK, except possibly tour guides quite often receive more than 10 or 15%. They quite often get 20, 30 and 40% tips, I believe, depending on how good they are. What do you think? Yeah, I, I also agree with those figures. And for London, I'd say 125 to 15% in restaurants is probably accurate. Is it the same in Belfast? Would you tip that? Yes, about the same, yeah. Now, Craig, there's a concept which, as far as I know, only exists in the UK. It's the only place where I've heard of it called service charge, which means you're obliged, obliged, not your choice, to pay usually between 10 and 20% extra if you're a large group. By large, typically it's six or more people. But this service charge, it must be written clearly on the menu. Yeah, it must be written that there's going to be a service charge. But if it is written on the menu, you must pay it. What do you think about this, Craig? What do you think about the service charge we have in the UK for big groups? I don't understand why it will be different for a big group. If there are six people or more, then the restaurant is earning more money. I do understand that if there's a compulsory service charge that you have to pay, then you pay it and you don't tip. If it's clear on the menu, I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand why it would only be applicable, only be applied if it's a big group. What do you think? Me, me neither, but that is the fact. In most UK restaurants, if there is a service charge, it clearly says for groups of six or more. So four of you don't have to pay it, but six of you do. Strange, but that's that's the way it is. It is strange. I mean, it's more work for the waiter or waitress, but it's they're earning more money. Would you give an additional tip as well as paying the service charge? No way. Me neither. No way. Absolutely nope. no way. Because it's compulsory that they're kind of making me pay it anyway, which is okay if the service is good. I'd be a bit annoyed if I paid 20% service charge, compulsory service charge, and the service was bad. I wouldn't go back. What about the USA, Craig? You probably know more about that than me because you've been more often than me to America. Well, there was an article on USA Today, usatoday.com. Again, there's a link in the show notes if you're interested to read that article. And this is what they say about tipping in the US. Restaurants, 15 to 20%, so more than in the UK. Bartenders, a bartender is the American expression for bar staff or barman. That's one to two dollars per drink, per drink, one to two dollars, or 15 to 20% of the bar tab. The bar tab, T-A-B, is the bar bill, your total cost for drinking in the bar. Car valets, we don't really have in Spain, do we? They're the people who collect your car when you arrive at a restaurant to eat and they park it for you and then they bring the car to you. You, you give them your keys and then they bring the car to you from the car park when you leave the restaurant. So that's two to five dollars to get your car for you. Taxi drivers, hairstylists, manicurists, people who 
look after your nails and treat your nails for you. And masseurs, people who give you massages, 15 to 20 percent. That's quite high. That's high, isn't it? Pizza delivery, at least two dollars to bring you your pizza. That's high, isn't it? I think <laughs> if the pizza only cost eight eight dollars and two more, oof, wow. Anyway, well, if I was buying a pizza in a takeaway pizza place, I wouldn't tip. But if they're bringing it to the house, I probably would. Yeah, I give them the small change in Spain. Keep the change, which is going to be twenty cents. I must admit, no more. I can't remember the last time I ordered a pizza, but yeah, a bellhop. A bellhop is a person who takes your bags to the room in a hotel and shows you how the television works and the air conditioning, etc. That's two dollars to start, and then one more dollar, one additional dollar per bag or per suitcase. So if you arrive at a hotel with three suitcases, that would be four dollars. And hotel staff, room cleaners, maids, and people who clean your room. Two to five dollars per night. So if you're staying for a week, that could be thirty-five dollars. I would happily tip those people five dollars if they clean the room well, mm -hmm. and I would consider it money well spent. But I wouldn't tip them anything if I thought the room was dirty. I must say. Yeah, me too. If it was, uh, if they cleaned it well, and I happen to see the maid because you don't always see the maid, then yeah, I probably would give her a small tip. Interestingly, what you said before about the hotels and the bellhops, the porters. When I was in Philadelphia this summer, I was going to collect my bags from a person who'd looked after the bags after I checked out, and I was with an American friend, and I didn't know whether to tip or not to tip because it's the service of the hotel. And I said, "Should I give this guy? Should I give this guy a tip?" He said, "Yeah, give him two, two to five dollars." And really, he just took my bag from the room and gave it to me. But it's a different culture. It's a tipping culture in America, and you pretty much tip for everything. Now we get to the difficult issue. We better be careful what we say about tipping in Spain, Craig. <laughs> Well, again, back to an article on Trip Savvy, a link in the show notes. Of course, they give advice on how to tip in Spain. And this is what they say. Tipping is less uniform in Spain than in the UK or in the USA, which means it's not as common or as constant, depending on several more factors. Why are tips in Spain generally much smaller than the UK and USA? Are they listeners from Spain? Do you agree? I think they are, to be honest. I do as well. Really. So why, why, Craig, are the Spanish less likely to tip or tip a smaller quantity? Why is that? My feeling is that they assume the person who's giving them the service has a salary, and it's not necessary to increase their salary by tipping them. I sometimes see Spanish people tipping when the service is exceptionally good, and the person deserves the tip, and I like that. I think you should reward good service with a tip. But if it's mediocre, if it's just normal or even bad service, then why tip? It shouldn't be expected. That's my opinion. What do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, particularly if the service isn't that good, people just leave the small change, which wouldn't be enough. For the British or Americans generally, so let's say it, it, costs it might you, even be an insult. It could, yeah, it could be worse than leaving nothing, like saying, "Oh, you're not worth any more than twenty cents." But sometimes I've seen Spanish clients being charged fourteen eighty, so they give fifteen and leave twenty cents. In Britain, not many people would do that. In a restaurant, they mm. would want to leave a bit more, probably. That's right. What, what do you think? Have you ever done it yourself? Just leave those twenty cents. I have in Spain because I think. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. So if the service wasn't that great, I think, well, I'm just going to leave the small change. But I must admit, I wouldn't do it in Britain because I, I don't want to annoy the waiter. Yeah, exactly. And I was eating once in a, in a restaurant in the United States, and I don't think I left a big enough tip. I think I might have left 10% instead of the accepted 15 to 20%. 
And the waiter did look very annoyed and very angry, definitely not happy. And it was because I, I wasn't sure, I didn't know, and I think I annoyed the waiter. In Spain, Craig, does it make a difference if a customer is a regular or not? A regular means a regular customer. Are they more likely to tip or not if they're a regular? I would be. Mm -hmm. There's a nice cafe, you know it, near where we work, near where our school is, that has very good Italian Illy coffee. Mm -hmm. And I really like going there. I enjoy the coffee. I enjoy the service. I enjoy the cakes and the pastries. It's a little above the quality of other cafes in the area, but it's the same price. They charge more or less the same price for the coffee. So I often leave a small tip because I really appreciate the way they're running the business and I want them to stay open. And if I can give a, a small help to make their profits a little higher, then instead of paying, what is it, one euro 20 or one euro 30 for a coffee with milk, sometimes I might leave 150. And just, you know, over time, if enough people do it, then I think that helps. And I appreciate the service and the, the quality of the food. Yeah, I totally agree. With but, but I'm a regular and they treat me very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, important. <laughs> Would you tip more in an expensive restaurant than in a local bar that just has like menu de dia? It's very basic. For me, it depends on the service. It might be an expensive restaurant, but if I feel the service was poor, I wouldn't tip at all. But if I feel the service is good, yeah, I guess the tip would be in proportion to the amount I'm being charged if I think that the charge is fair. But do you feel more pressure in a more expensive restaurant to leave a tip or a bigger tip? I do. Me too. I do feel the pressure. But as I say, if, I, if the service is bad, which occasionally has happened to me, I resist the pressure. It's uncomfortable, but I do resist. <laughs> I would prefer the service to be good and then I can tip happily. Craig, what do you think about this? Don't know if the many listeners know, uh, unless they're they're all quite old and were around at the time. Did you know that in fact tipping was prohibited by law in Barcelona in Spain for no, a while? No, I didn't. I didn't know that. That's news to me. Do you know why? By law. Yes, I just came across it when I was reading a book years ago, many years ago. We had that phrasal verb before, to come across. To come across, yeah. Um, to find by accident. Right, without looking. It was a book all about the Spanish Civil War, which uh, I found very interesting many years ago when I first arrived in Spain. Many people will know it, Homage to Catalonia, it's called, although it's actually more about the Spanish Civil War than Catalonia by George Orwell. So he witnessed this at first hand because he was a, a volunteer uh, fighter in the Spanish Civil War. What does first hand mean? First hand in this context means that he witnessed it he saw it because he was there in the place that it happened. He didn't see it on a video. He didn't read about it in a book. He was actually physically there. And he describes the context quite possibly better than anybody else has ever done of why this happened. Uh, it's all to do with the fact that he was in the, the revolutionary Republic in Barcelona of, the, of 1936 or 1937 during the, the Spanish Civil War. So, and it was the idea that everyone should be equal. So who is anybody to tip anybody else, you know, like you're superior and they're inferior or something like that. So I'll just give you a quote of what happened to George Orwell. He said, tipping had been forbidden by law since the time of Primo de Rivera. And that was the Spanish... Uh, leader a few years before that. Almost my first experience was receiving a lecture from a hotel manager for trying to tip a lift boy. So he tried to give a tip and the hotel manager said, no, no, we no, don't well, we do not do that here. And, and shouted at him and said, no, you can't do that. Who are you to tip this boy? We're all equal. So that's how he found out about it. Strange, it, eh? But it, true. Yeah, very strange. But it's changed a lot now. I think with the tourists to visit Barcelona, it's very common to tip. Yeah, you might be told off if you don't tip now. So what started out as a reward for exceptional or very good service has now become compulsory. And there's a guy called Michael Lynn, who is a professor at Cornell University in the United States. And he's written more than 50 research papers on tipping. And this is what Michael Lynn thinks. And I'm quoting here. Tipping starts with people wanting to be generous or to show off. To show off means to give a good impression to other people. But then it becomes something where people just do it because it's expected of them, he says. 
when we tip, we're essentially buying the right to avoid disapproval and guilt, which is a unique first world problem. Do you agree with that? I think that's definitely more focused on the USA than Europe. Yes. In the third world, from what I know and from what I've seen, tipping doesn't really take place unless it's by foreigners tipping there. The locals don't really tip unless they are extremely, extraordinarily wealthy and they're showing off. But apart from that, it just doesn't happen in poor countries. But I know. What, what, what have you seen? No, exactly the same. They just don't have the resources. They don't have the money to leave tips. A final comment by Michael Lynn, who says that studies have shown that waitresses with large breasts, smaller body sizes and blonde hair tend to earn more tips than waitresses without such attributes or without such features. And a separate study by Lynn found that white servers or white waiters are tipped more than black waiters for the same quality service, regardless of the race of the customer, which means it doesn't matter if the customer's black or white, they tend to give white people, white servers, more money. Well, I presume, just to put this in the context, I presume that Michael Lynn is talking about the United States, yeah? He is. I imagine it's a different story in Africa or, or somewhere else. But it's an, an official study, yeah? I mean, it's not surprising if you think about it, but it's quite shocking. I was quite quite shocked when I read it. It's not I, fair. I'm, I'm afraid to say I'm not shocked about the, the racism of white uh, customers, some white customers not all, wanting to tip white waiters more. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I think it's absolutely unacceptable. But I'm not surprised it happens. But I am surprised that black customers would also give more tips to white waiters. Me that too. surprises yeah. me. You'd think it'd be the opposite, perhaps. Yeah, as a kind of way of, you know, uh, redressing the balance. What does that mean? To redress is like to try and balance something which is unbalanced. But no, apparently black people tip white people more as well. Wow. Yeah, surprising. And now it's your turn to practice your English. What is your view on tipping? Which professions expect tips in your country? And what percentage, if any, is acceptable in restaurants where you live? Send us a voice message. You can do that by going to speakpipe.com slash English podcast. Or send us an email with a comment or question to me, Craig, at inglespodcast.com. Or belfastreza at gmail.com. And we want to thank all our wonderful patrons who are supporting the podcast. Their names are on our website at inglespodcast.com. Special thanks to Bruno, our gold sponsor, who continues to support us and offers walking tours of Copenhagen through his company, copenhagenwalkingtour.com. You can go visit castles, you can see the city and have guides in English or Spanish. Also, if you're going to Rio de Janeiro, why not take a walking tour of the favela area? It's led by local guides, it's very safe, and it also helps the community to improve their daily needs. And don't forget to tip your tour guide. <laughs> go to Bruno's website to find out more information. That's favelawalkingtour.com.br. If you want to join our Patreon program for just $1 a month and get instant access to recent transcriptions of the audio that have been lovingly transcribed by Angelica Bello from Madrid, have a look at www.patreon.com slash podcast. And welcome to our new Patreon supporters this month who have just joined us. That's Jorge Torres, Joshua, Molina Mendez, Miguel Salazar, Edith Clavijo Moreno, and Jose Manuel Pelaiz in Verón. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your names. Thank you for joining us and welcome to our Patreon program. What's next week, Reza? On next week's episode, words from Shakespeare. Okay, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later.